I am attorney Mary Chris Batan Lasco. This is my virtual classroom. Welcome to my YouTube channel. In this channel, I shall aim to simplify the law. I will discuss concepts and principles of law in under 10 minutes. So hi everyone. Um, so this is our third video lecture. I will be covering an enforceable contract. Mm -hmm. So um, this is the third defective contract. So we're done with resistible contracts. We're done with um, voidable contracts. And now we're on to unenforceable contracts. Now, what do we mean by unenforceable contracts? This are, these rather are contracts that cannot be enforced by proper court action. In other words, if you enter into such contract, supposing you enter into a contract with A, and it is an unenforceable contract. If A will not abide by the terms that you agreed upon, you cannot ask help from the courts. You cannot file a case in court to compel A to do his part in the agreement because it is unenforceable. So that is one of the characteristics of an unenforceable contract. It cannot be enforced by a proper action in court. There is a second characteristic. It is susceptible of ratification. It may be expressed or it may, may be implied. And third is that the they rather cannot be assailed by third persons. Now, 1403 gives out this, the, the three types of unenforceable contracts. So first you have the unauthorized contracts or those entered into in the name of another person by one who has been given no authority or legal representation or one who has acted beyond his powers. So for example, I have a car. If my brother will sell my car without any authority from me, then the sale of that car to his friend is unenforceable. What does that mean? That means that even if his friend has already paid him the money for the car, that friend cannot file an action against me to deliver the car to him. Why? Because that sale is unenforceable. It is an unauthorized contract. Another is when uh, a person who may have been authorized but has went beyond the authority. So for example, I authorize my brother to borrow money um, in my behalf, and the car will be used as a collateral. So that is the authority that I am giving him to borrow money and use the car as collateral. Now, my brother exceeded his authority by selling the car. He may have had the authority, but he exceeded in such authority. That is still an unenforceable contract, an unauthorized contract, the first class of unenforceable contracts. The second type is those that do not comply with the statute of frauds. Now, what is this statute of frauds? What does that require you to do? It tells you that there are certain types of contracts that must be in writing to be enforceable. And what are these contracts? Those enumerated under number two, um, Article 1403. So that's from A to E. Now, why, why is it necessary to put it into writing? The reason for the statute of frauds to make those contracts, those enumerated A to E, that it be unenforceable if it is not in writing, is to prevent fraud. Why does it prevent fraud? Because if these contracts, those that I will discuss later on, these contracts enumerated, if they are not put into writing, if you just enter into such contracts orally, okay, it might perpetrate fraud. Why? Because man's memory is faulty. Okay? We might forget the terms of the contract that we have entered into. So to prevent mistake, to prevent fraud, then the law gives us this statute of frauds that for these types of contracts, it must be in writing. And another thing that you must remember in statute of frauds is that this is only applicable to what? What kind of 
uh, of contracts. Those contracts that are executory, meaning yet to be executed. So if it is already partially executed, then that contract is already removed from the statute of frauds. Now let's talk about or enumerate rather those contracts that must be in writing to comply with the statute of frauds. A, an agreement that by its terms is not to be performed within a year from the making thereof. So if you have an agreement and it will not take effect um, within a year, from the time you entered into such contract, it must be in writing. So if, let's say, you enter into a contract of loan, but the loan will take effect only next year, okay? Not within one year from the time that you executed the contract. The law says that you must put it into writing. Why? Because if you do not put it into writing, then it is unenforceable. So when that date comes, and this is already beyond one year from the entering of such contract, you can no longer compel by court action the other person to abide by the terms of the contract. Again, the reason for this is to prevent fraud, to prevent mistake, because man's memory is faulty. So if a contract is just entered into orally, you might have forgotten the terms. Or someone might use such um, faulty memory to defraud the other. So to avoid that, the law requires that it must be in writing to be enforceable. Okay? Second, a special promise to answer for the debt, default, or miscarriage of another. So for example, a surety, okay? a guarantor, that must also be in writing to be enforceable. Third, an agreement made in consideration of marriage other than a mutual promise to marry. Fourth, an agreement for the sale of goods, chattels, or things in action at a price not less than 500 pesos unless the buyer accept and receive part of such goods and chattels or the evidences or some of them of such things in action or pay at the time some part of the purchase money. But, when a sale is made by auction, an entry is made by the auctioneer in his sales book at the time of the sale of the amount and kind of property sold, terms of sale, price, names of the purchasers, and person in whose account the sale is made, it is a sufficient memorandum. So let's go back to the first half of that. It says there that an agreement of the sale of goods, okay, where the price is not less than 500 pesos, it must be in writing. So if it is less than 500 pesos, it may be orally made and you may enforce it by an action in court if the other will not abide by the terms of the agreement. But if it is not less than 500 pesos, meaning 500 pesos or more, and it involves a sale, it must be in writing. So if you if you sell a particular car, if you sell a, a particular mobile phone, which is 500 pesos or more, the sale must be in writing to be enforceable. What does that mean? Again, it must be in writing so that if either one of you breaches your agreement, then the other can file a case in court. Of course, there's no problem if it is orally made and you abide by the terms of the agreement, one pays and then the other delivers, then it's already removed from the statute of frauds. Why? Because it's no longer executory. It's already done. It's executed. That's why I said earlier, it refers only to executory contracts. Now, if you read that um, paragraph D also, it says there, unless there is all already... Uh, part delivery or uh, partial delivery rather and partial payment because again we said the statute of frauds will cover only executory contracts if it's already partially executed you can no longer use the statute of frauds so for example um, a sells a particular car to be for 300,000 pesos and it was orally made 
but B makes a down payment of 100,000 to A. And the agreement was it will be delivered only um, delivered only when full payment is made. And there was no written contract. So if you follow the statute of frauds, if B will now fully pay, A can use the statute of frauds in saying that, no, I'm not going to deliver the car because this is unenforceable. You cannot sue me in court if we use the statute of frauds, right? But since it's already partially executed, the law tells you the statute of frauds will no longer ap apply. Why? Because the purpose of the statute of frauds is to prevent fraud. If we use the statute of frauds in that example, it will now aid in the fraud that will be committed by A against B. So even if it was just orally made, A sold the car to B for 300000 or orally made, since there was already partial execution by B partially paying A, then A can no longer use the statute of frauds. A can no longer say that, no, this is unenforceable because it is not written. He can no longer use that because it is already partially executed. So you have to remember that. If there's already partial execution, statute of frauds will no longer apply. It would have been different if it was the sale of the car for 300,000 pesos and then there's no payment yet. So B cannot compel A by court action for A to deliver because there's no partial payment yet. There's no partial execution yet, okay? So that is what is meant by that. And last, uh, E rather, so uh, I'm sorry, earlier I said until E, it should be until F. So E, an agreement of the leasing for a longer period than one year or for the sale of real property or of an interest therein. So again, these um, types of contracts must be in writing to be enforceable if it is orally made it is unenforceable but then again if it is already fully executed one has paid the other has delivered then there's no need to be there's no need to bring up statute of frauds because again the statute of frauds will cover or apply only to executory contracts and then lastly, uh, representation as to the credit of a third person. So if you try to represent someone um, as, as being able to, to pay a loan, you must also have to put that in writing to be enforceable. So again, the first type of an enforceable contract we mentioned already, the unauthorized contracts. And then second, those that do not comply with the statute of frauds. And then third, is those where both parties are incapable of giving consent to a contract. So, if A is a minor, B is a minor, both are incapacitated to give consent to a contract and they enter into a contract, then that contract is unenforceable. A is a minor, B is capacitated, only one is incapacitated, that is not unenforceable. That is voidable. Again, if only one is incapacitated, the other is capacitated, voidable. If both are incapacitated, unenforceable. Okay. Now, let's go back to the statute of frauds. Can the statute of frauds be waived? Yes, it may be waived. So for example, um, it is an oral sale of a particular car, okay? It was not done in writing. Now, the seller now sues the buyer to, to pay the particular car with an agreed price. Again, no written contract. This should have uh, been covered by the statute of frauds, right? That means that the seller should not have been able to um, successfully pursue a case uh, a court action against the buyer. But supposing the buyer answers the case and he does not raise the defense of the statute of frauds, then 
he has uh, he is deemed to have waived such defense so uh, in other words if you are being sued and the contract is supposedly an unenforceable contract then your lawyer must be quick to identify it and to use the defense that this is unenforceable and therefore you cannot be sued okay so this is what i mentioned earlier 1405 um contracts infringing the statute of frauds are ratified by the failure to object to the presentation of oral evidence to prove the same or by the acceptance of benefit under them. Um, I mentioned before that one of the characteristics of an unenforceable contract is ratification. It may be expressed or implied. So if you fail to object in a case in court um, that this is an unenforceable contract, there's no written contract, then you have, um, you have waived such right to raise it. And another is um, acceptance of the benefit. So let's go back to my example where my brother sold my car without my authority. So if my brother sells a car, he gets the proceeds of the sale. I did not authorize him. But then I get the money. I put it in the bank. And then I withdraw it and I spend it. That's acceptance of the benefits. So even if the sale wasn't authorized, it has already been ratified. So the defect has now been cured by my ratification. Now, what is 1406? It says, when a contract is enforceable under the statute of frauds, meaning you comply with uh, with the fact that the contract is written and it is a contract and under the, the enumeration from A to E, and a public document is necessary for its registration in the Registry of Deeds, the parties may avail themselves of the right under Article 1357. What is 1357? 1357 grants a party the right to compel the other to observe a particular form. So let's say sale of a uh, parcel of land. That's covered under the statute of frauds. To be enforceable, it must be in writing. But what if it's just an, the sale rather is just in a private instrument? Now, if it's a sale of a parcel of land, you want to transfer it in your name, the registry of deeds will require that it be notarized, meaning that it must be in a public document. So if it's in writing, it's already enforceable, then you can compel the other party, the seller, to have the deed of sale notarized. To observe a particular form because anyway it is already enforceable now 1407 tells you the effect of ratification when both of the parties are incapable of giving consent and who may also ratify so 1407 in a contract where both parties are incapable of giving consent again express or implied ratification by whom parent or guardian, as the case may be, of one of the contracting parties shall give the contract the same effect as if only one of them were incapacitated. So again, A is a minor, B is a minor. A's parent ratifies a contract. So what happens now? Ratified in the side. So it is now as if only one is incapacitated. That means now that the status of the contract has now been raised to it being voidable, valid until annulled. But the second paragraph of 1407 says, if ratification is made by either the parent or the guardian of both contracting parties, so it cures the defect, what happens now? The contract now becomes valid. So again, the effect of ratification, both are incapable of giving consent, ratified here, it becomes voidable. If, again, incapable, but both the um, both parties' parents or guardians ratify the contract, then the contract becomes valid. That ends our discussion on um, unenforceable contracts. So, if you find this video helpful, please click like, subscribe, and that notification bell so that you will be notified of new video uploads. Thank you for watching. See you next time in MBL Classroom.